Hello. Well, now that Lukas has basically told you everything that needs to be said about it, I can just say thank you for attending and leave. No. Okay. Um, first about me, I'm Andreas. Um, I work at MongoDB. I work on the PHP driver. And I'm a maintainer at Doctrine. So I maintain the Doctrine MongoDB ODM um, and a bunch of other tools that we have. I am active in the Symfony community, although not as of late. And in my previous role, I also used Cilius in an e-commerce solution. And that's basically where I have all my knowledge of it from. And when we think of Cilius and MongoDB, this is what comes to mind. Um, it's actually deprecated. It will be removed in 2.0. Also, there's a lot of noise coming from the other room. I'm sorry if, I, if that distracts me. Um, it's deprecated, will be removed. But this is actually a good thing. Because the way it was done wasn't how you would want it to be done. And to explain this, we need to talk about schemas. And when we talk about schemas, we usually think of relational databases. And schemas there are usually very simple. We have a bunch of normalization rules. They help us design somewhat good schemas if we follow them. So it usually looks like this, if the clicker works. We have a primary key, and we add everything that's, uh, that depends on the primary key. If it doesn't depend on the primary key, we extract it to a separate table. We do this a bunch more times, and then money starts rolling in, obviously. Easy stuff. OK. MongoDB is a little more complicated, because people like to say MongoDB is schema-less when it's not. Also, if you're wondering about me turning around, I'm old and I can't see my notes over there, so I'm terribly sorry. Um, MongoDB isn't schema-less. It has a flexible schema, meaning that our documents, our documents can have different fields. If I add something new to my collection, to an entity, I don't have to add it to everything at once. There's no need to take your database offline for nine hours to update 50 million records and add a simple bool field. No, we don't need to add it to everything else. It avoids some constraints of relational databases. And that's, for me, the reason why I like using MongoDB even before they paid me to do it. Um, because relational databases are from the 70s. And a lot of the things we do, we do for reasons that were very valid in the 1970s, which Blows my mind, it's 50 years ago. So when we design schemas for MongoDB, what I tell people is don't think about how to store data. You want to think about how you consume it. And to make an example for that, we're going to start out with something a little easier than Cilius today. We're going to take a look at an address book. So if we design an address book and we have an API that gives us our data, this is what we want to get. Nice, simple document containing a name, a couple of email addresses, a couple of phone numbers, nothing fancy. Well, OK. Maybe we do want to make it a bit more fancy and store a type, store some extra information. And at this point, if you've done relational databases in the past years, you will know that we're not going to put this whole thing in a table, because we're always thinking about how to store it, because we're going to need to query it. And this is how we would query it. We do a join. We find someone by email address. We join on the email address table. If we want to find someone by phone number, we join on the phone number table. This is good. We've done it. Perfect. What's the problem with it? Well, first of all, we now suddenly have to join to a separate table to find our main record, which is already not optimal. but. I mean, we've done it for the past 50 years. We can keep doing it. We're also only going to get our main record back. All the email addresses, everything else, we're going to have to run extra queries to get them. Usually, Doctrine does that for you. You will not notice it until you load 1,000 records and you realize, wait, why is this thing running more than 1,000 database queries? Whoops. The other option would be you know, we could add a bunch of left joins and just left join our you know, uh, record with the emails and phone numbers and everything. It would work, but then we'd have to need, do some complicated logic to clean that up. So how exactly does this help us when we normalize data to store it in a database? So when we would do this in MongoDB with this example before, 
this is the query that we'd run to find someone by an email address. Nice and simple. We just say we want to query on the field called email. It has an embedded document in it that has an address, and we query that. And then we get our entire record back. And the cool thing is, this works regardless of whether email is one document or, as we saw before, a list of documents. MongoDB will take care of, us, of that for us. So, I mean, I may be biased, but this looks a lot simpler for us. So this is the hot take that if you want to, you can um, take a picture of and burn me on Twitter for it. Um, normalization is a relic. We needed to do it because you know, we didn't want to duplicate data because storage was ridiculously expensive. If you have a server with a disk of 200 megabyte, you start thinking about how much are you going to duplicate. You didn't have fast writes. You didn't have fast reads. Network traffic was low. We needed to do it, but these days, why? All right. But I'm not here to talk about normalization. I'm here to talk about Cilius and MongoDB. So let's talk about that. What's the actual problem with Cilius and MongoDB? I mean, Cilius uses the doctrine ORM, which is great. We know that the doctrine ORM and MongoDB ODM are very similar. They share interfaces. We can reuse the entities. So I mean, how hard could it be to get Cilius to support MongoDB? Why don't we just read ORM mappings in ODM? We have it all there. We know the relationship between entities. We could take that and store it in MongoDB, which, by the way, was pretty much what was happening before it was deprecated. So to explain why we don't want to do that, I hope you all are technical folks, so I don't have to explain the whole thing. And I hope Cilius hasn't changed it in the three years since I built that slide. So this is an entity relationship diagram of the main product stack. Products, options, their values, variants, channel pricings, everything that we need to show a product and you know, categorize it with Texans and store everything. We built this, and then we think about how do we store this? And we usually end up with something like this. So this is 19 tables just to store basically what we need for a product, channels, attribute values, and everything. And the reason why we don't want to take this to MongoDB is because we can make use of some advanced schema types. Okay? So your relational database system will know one type of relationship, which is a reference. You create a foreign key constraint, you store an identifier in your other table, and you know, your attribute translation points to the attribute, and the product translation points to the product. This is all good. In MongoDB, we can use embedded data, so we don't have to put stuff in separate collections like we do in relational databases. You could do it in relational databases as well. You could use JSONB and live with some very ugly queries. You could, in PostgreSQL, um, use complex types, but we said we're using Doctrine ORM, so that's not going to happen because it doesn't support it. And there are advantages to both. So we sometimes want to reference stuff. We sometimes want to embed stuff. And the tricky thing is figuring out when we do which of these two. And so to do this, we're just going to look at some examples from Cilius. And we're going to start out with something relatively simple, taxons. We have taxons, and we have their translations. This is how we would want to consume it in an API. We get the base data, we add some translations to it, and the translations are just an object. So we can access translations by key. We don't want to iterate over an array and find the right translation. We also don't want to do a separate query as it is right now to get our translation. So we just access it by, um, by our language, and we get all our translated fields. I could even simplify this a little bit and say, well, Every field stores its own translations, just like we did before. So we don't need to use complex objects. Doesn't matter which we choose, because at the moment, the ecosystem doesn't support either. The translations are managed by the Doctrine Extensions package, which, even for MongoDB, will always store your translations in a separate collection. Tough luck. OK, so that's 
a relatively simple value. I mean, we're just storing strings at this point. What about more complex stuff? Let's take a look at options and option values. We extract option values because, well, first normalization rule says we need to have atomic values, so we can't really store an array in our database table, right? But if we have arrays as first-class uh, first types, we could store them like this because there's no other reason to extract a value from the option if not for storage. It belongs to this option. It's not going to be reused for something else. My option value for a length, I probably shouldn't use it for anything else because I'm just asking for trouble at that point. So we could store it like this. This would be nice for an API. I get it directly. I don't have to do expansive queries. Relatively simple. But we can't always do that. Until now, we've basically always embedded data. So yeah, we could go ahead and say, well, you know what, let's actually read ORM mappings and just say anything that is a one-to-many relationship, we just embed it. Store everything in one document. Great, works. Until we get to products. Products have to reference options. What are you going to do there? We're going to reuse the options for different products. So we're actually going to reference them. How do we do that? We store a bunch of IDs, except we shouldn't. Because while you usually have a foreign key on, in this case, your options ID that you would store, MongoDB doesn't have that concept, which sucks, I know. It's kind of like my ease, I mean, the good old days where you would create a foreign key and it would say, oh yes, I've created it for you, I'm definitely not going to honor it and you can do whatever you want. That's MongoDB, so we use a different strategy here. We actually store a reference object where we tell or let the document tell us what it is. In this case, it's a reference to the product option table and it references the document with this ID. So we do have to use references. So it's a little more complicated. We really can't read ORM mappings. So you can already see these mappings are going to require a lot of effort to build. It's not something that, you know, you do while you're on the way to a conference or out in the hallway track. And we're just getting started because the Cilia stack is a lot bigger than this. So we talked about referencing documents or embedding them, but the question is, is there another way? For example, if we look at product variants, where we now have to link the product, the product options, and the option values and tie it together, what can we do there? Because we don't own the data, we don't own the option, we don't own option values, we don't own the product, so we should definitely reference that data, right? Then on the other hand, we don't want to join on that because it's a lot of options potentially. Um, show of hands, who's running a Cilia shop? Right. So either some people are sleeping or you're learning about Cilius, which is good. Um, say a number, anyone, who has more than 10 options on a product, for example? Yeah. Yeah. What's, you're laughing, okay, what's, what's the highest number of options you have on a product? Guess. 50? Even more, okay. So you don't really want to do a whole bunch of joins on that, right? You would love to just have that data right there because every join is expensive. And we can't even reference an embedded document Technically, we could, but how do we even reference it? An embedded document doesn't have an identifier, it especially doesn't have an identifier where we can guarantee its uniqueness. So if we have a list of options, we could say, well, we're referencing the option with the ID so-and-so, and we're referencing the fifth option. But then if we reorder them for some reason, we're in trouble. So maybe let's not do that. So the best thing to do is actually do both. We reference and embed stuff. And we should even do that for other stuff. So to go back to the example from before, where we're storing a reference to an option, we can add more data to this reference object. We don't just have to store the ID, we can add anything we want to it. 
So in this case, we could go ahead and say, well, we want to store the code of the option and the name. And anyone that has studied database normalization is probably going, getting ready to kill me because this is not kosher. This is like, oh, no, don't do that. If we change the option, yes, we're going to have to go and update every single product. But how often are you going to do that? As opposed to reading the product, you're going to read it a lot more often. So in these cases, we definitely want to duplicate data in order to save on reads. So this works. Unfortunately, it's a little more complex than this in some cases. Um, when you, for example, get two variants. Variants, again, link options and their values. So we could say, well, we have an options object. We use the code of the option as a key, and then we just copy the entire option value in there because we're going to need all of that data. Again, how often are you going to change the option value? You might add a translation here and there. Yep, just go ahead and update. But other than that, that data is static. You don't need to join for that data, which means that right in this case, you could read a product variant and you could directly show all of it without doing any joins, without reading from related tables, but you still have the option of figuring out where you're coming from. You know the option code. You have a reference to that in the product. You know the actual code of the value. So you can do it. In this case, you could even query for variance by a specific option value without having to join across tables at all, which, again, when you have multiple options, and you have hundreds and thousands of products, is going to be slow. But there's just one problem with that. What would we do with something like product variants, where you know, kind of the product variant is owned by the product because it inherits a lot of data from it, and it's not really unrelated? On the other hand, I mean, you could see the potential problem with this. This is one product variant. If you have 500 or 1,000 product variants, do you really want to store a document where you embed 1,000 product variants in that document? You could. I mean, you have 16 megabytes of data that you can store in a single document, so it would definitely fit in there. But reading it might take a little bit longer, especially if you hydrate it using Doctrine, it's going to get problematic and you might start seeing out of memory exceptions. So this is the case where you really have to consider the use case. What's best now? Do I embed them and be able to read them quickly? Or do I store them separately? Because in an order, we might want to reference them. And that's also one of the reasons why I haven't bothered with this yet, even though when I was using Cilius, we were already using MongoDB, because those questions aren't easy to solve. And for the past three years, I haven't had a use case to actually solve them. But you can see we can do a lot more with MongoDB schemas than we can do with relational schemas. So that brings me on to a second point, which in my previous talks, and this is what um, Lukas was referring to, I had this nice hot take of you don't need transactions, you just need a different schema. Still, when we're doing e-commerce, we can't skip talking about transactions. And when I was doing Silius in an e-commerce shop before, we were discussing, you know, using MongoDB for Silius and for e-commerce, and one of my colleagues said to me, you can't use MongoDB for e-commerce because it doesn't support transactions. I'm like, well, yeah, okay, it doesn't support transactions, it didn't back then, um, but why wouldn't I want to use it for e-commerce? I mean, I can work around it. And we saw in the examples before Lots of places where we use transactions, we don't actually need them. If you store an option in one table and its translations in another table and its values in another table and those translations in a separate table, yeah, anytime you create a new option, you're going to write records in four tables. You don't want that to stop somewhere in the middle because of an error and then lose half your data. No, you're going to use a transaction and you're done with it. But in this case, we don't. We're just creating one single document. It's all in one document, and a single document write is always going to work out completely or not. 
So the first thing about transactions in MongoDB is MongoDB was always asset compliant, even before we had transactions. The thing is, we now have multi-document transactions, and that was missing for a long time. When you did have to update two collections or two documents in the same collection, there was no way to ensure that both of these writes happen or none of them happen, which I heard is a big deal. The big thing is we don't have nested transactions in MongoDB. I know some people have use cases for them. I personally still don't understand why you need nested transactions. So we are going good with that. And I'm still of the opinion that if you design your schema properly, you can avoid transactions as long as necessary. So still, when we do schemas in MongoDB and we store data in MongoDB, we don't recommend to wrap every write in a transaction. Because if you're just writing a single document, there's no point. Just like you wouldn't start a transaction for every single insert statement when you're just doing one. Yeah, this is, this is where slide design really comes in. The main important thing about transactions is MongoDB ODM, or the doctrine MongoDB ODM, doesn't support them yet. This is unfortunately a relic of how doctrine MongoDB ODM is built. I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but a transaction in MongoDB is actually just as simple as anywhere else. We start a client session. Um, client session is our object that contains a transaction. It can ensure certain consistency levels. You can, with a client session, for example, ensure that you're only reading data that has been um, persisted to a majority of your servers, of your cluster. We start a transaction, we do some complex database logic, and we commit it. Now, if there's an error, we show the user a 500 page, like we would in a relational database. And if it goes through, we're all happy. Except that it's a little more complicated. Um, because in certain cases, when a commit fails, we can actually retry it. So in this case, there's a couple of error codes that we can check. And if any of those errors come up, we don't have to show the user a 500 page. We just commit the transaction again. And again, and again, and again. And I used a nice infinite loop there. Maybe it needs an exit condition, but then maybe the user also wants to wait forever. So that's already a big thing. You know, we don't always have to show the user an error. I heard it kills conversion when users see a 500 page. It goes a little further than that, and you know that your code is probably too complicated to be put in by a user every time when you have to make the font on the slide smaller. In certain cases, like transient transaction errors, we can retry the entire transaction. Now, what's a transient transaction error? Let's say two users check out at the same time and we have to update the stock for the same product. One decrements it, the next one decrements it, we're gonna have a conflict here because the document was modified outside of our transaction. We could show on a 500 error, or we could just retry the whole thing. We start the transaction again, and we store it again. Of course, you need to up make your writes and your entire complex database logic ad impotent because it's not going to be good if you just set the same value again. You know, you set quantity to 500. Whoops, didn't work, set quantity to 500. Well, few people are going to like it because they can order something even though it's not there anymore. So in order to spare you doing this the entire time and bothering with boring MongoDB internals, we eventually went back and redid our API a little bit. So it's actually a lot simpler. You start a client session, you have a nice closure that does your logic, and you run with transaction. What does it do? It's exactly that loop that you saw before, except that we break off the infinite loop after two minutes. Two minutes is a long time. And it's too long for PHP, however. The people that designed this decided that two minutes is a sensible time to try and write it. It's not configurable. So if this is something that you would want to use and you say, my users don't want to wait for two minutes until their transaction completes, do raise an issue and complain about it loudly. So this is neat. I can have a closure with all my transactional logic. As long as it's item potent, I can retry it and retry it and retry it, and eventually it will hopefully go through. So we could use this to shoehorn transaction support 
into the MongoDB ODM, right? So, I mean, we could just, you know, build a closure, take our document manager, which is the same thing as an object manager, call flush, give it the session option so that every write happens in the session with the transaction, and it's good. Except this is one of those moments where you see that 10 years ago when ODM was created, somebody got lazy, basically copied ORM, re did a batch replace on it to replace ORM with ODM, because this fails horribly. And this is exactly the reason why you get the dreaded, the entity manager is closed exception when something like this happens. Because unit of work completely craps itself when it doesn't get to finish all its writes. It does one write and it says, well, this is done, I'll just remove it. I don't need to take care of this again. But we just said, we're repeating it. So if you're thinking about using something like this for transactions, please never do. It breaks horribly. So what's next? for Cilius and MongoDB. I mean, we saw it's being dropped. And what would actually be necessary to support it? Well, the ecosystem needs updating. It may surprise you, but a shocking amount of the ecosystem, it's still very much centered around the idea of relational databases and the concepts. Not just, it doesn't just not support MongoDB, but it also doesn't support newer things in relational databases, like complex types in PostgreSQL like JSONB columns, where you could do a bunch of this stuff even in a relational database. If we're talking about Doctrine MongoDB ODM, and I'm happy to say that I'm actually going to tackle this work, unit of work needs to be essentially rewritten to support transactions. Now, if you've ever looked into your unit of work in ORM, um, it's the same in ODM, and it's this file that you open up, you scroll through, and then you close it and hope you never have to look at it ever again. Imagine maintaining it, it doesn't get any better from there. And I've been doing it for five years now, I still don't understand all of it, so yay me. It's a good idea to go tinkering in that. We have to support some new update mechanisms in MongoDB. So in MongoDB, you can do atomic updates on a lot of things. You can atomically add items to an array, you can pull items to an array, you can reorder arrays. You can reorder arrays, then accumulate data from them. So if you were to want to recalculate the prices in an order after changing the quantity, you don't have to do this in the PHP side and then update it. You can push an order unit to the order, and then in the next stage, recalculate the complete total. But ODM doesn't support this yet. So this is something that needs to happen. What else? Hybrid references, it looked so cool before. You know, we have our reference and our ID and we store extra data in it. Doesn't work. Need support? There is a pull request that I started five years ago when I wanted to add it, but I gave up because, well, we're eventually gonna have to update it as well. What's needed to update that? Nothing major, just the metadata system in Doctrine needs rewriting because you can't backtrack references. So that's a bit of an issue. Even if we didn't want to do all of that, even if we said, you know what, let's actually just copy ORM mappings. Screw building good schemas in MongoDB, let's just do it somehow. The translations extension doesn't support this extra stuff. It would be nice to have it. The tree, exten uh, the tree extension doesn't support nested set in ODM. So your taxon tree, that works beautifully. If you switch to ODM, doctrine extensions would completely crap itself. The sortable extension, which is used to sort variants, also doesn't support ODM. And last but not least, obviously, we'd have to create a ton of mapping files in Cilius, ensure they're updated, ensure they're tested, ensure they work. And, oh, we just have to rewrite every query that we ever had because it most likely uses DQL, which you don't want to use for ODM. So you can see it's a lot of work, um, but it's open source, and it needs you. Cilius is open source and backed by a big company. The doctrine extensions that are used to manage translations, to handle the tree functionality, to handle sortable, that isn't. That's a poor dude in his free time sitting there looking at an issue tracker going, oh crap, I don't want to do this, and closing it again. Doctrine itself is maintained by volunteers. So if we want to have a chance to bring the ecosystem forward to support new stuff, we're gonna have to do it ourselves.
So if you're interested in contributing to something like that, even if it's just a small thing, a typo fix, an extra test case, or a bug report that is easily reproducible because you've ran into an issue, please do it. It's what keeps the entire ecosystem alive. And if you use MongoDB already, try some of the stuff that I said. Report issues when they don't work. If you don't use MongoDB, try it. You may end up liking it, because it's actually really cool. And with that, I'll leave you with a QR code. It's to the slides. Don't worry, I'm not rickrolling you or anything. If you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on Twitter. I'm on GitHub if you want to follow me there. Uh, maybe one of the people that follow me there can maybe explain to me what following someone on GitHub actually is and does. Or if you want to get in touch with me on Slack, I'm in the Symfony Dev Slack. I can't handle another Slack, so I usually am offline in the Cilius Slack. If you've written me there, I probably won't ever reply. Um, with that, we do have some time for questions. Uh, so. OK, there is a question already. Well. Um, you mentioned contributing to that. Uh, is there any organized effort uh, around supporting MongoDB on Silius? No. Um, there is a shared vision between Lukas and I in the fact that we would love to see it. But I'll be very honest, this kind of work, you don't really want to do it yourself unless someone really, really needs it. So if there was a customer that paid for it, I'm sure Silius would be happy to do it. I would be happy to do it. Um, there is a somewhat organized effort to do some of these things. So I, m I mentioned doing transaction support in Doctrine ODM. That's actually on my plate at work at MongoDB. Um, we want to be more active in the open source community, make sure to su that tools support it better. And one of the first things that we need to work on is obviously the Doctrine ODM. Um, but there is no organized effort beyond that at the moment. Anybody else? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so, so you mentioned uh, some of the Silius extensions that uh, cr uh, currently doesn't support uh, yes. MongoDB. Uh, would it require a lot of effort to get them to work with it? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so it's not like just uh, they are using the wrong interface. It's uh, a much uh, larger project. It is a larger project, yes. You could probably, like I said, you could work, make it work um, by just reading different metadata. Um, but what's the point of using a document database that supports a lot more than your relational database does if you're just going to do the same thing? Um, there is no point in that. Um, so, yes, it is a lot of effort, and the question is always, why would you want to do it? You could have a customer. It could make things a lot faster. Um, I'm going to have a couple of questions for you as to your experience with lots of options and lots of variants. I'm really curious to see how you made that work, um, or made it work fast. Yeah, you, you dug yourself in a hole there, sorry. Um, but there are some things that can significantly be improved. But most importantly, it's about offering users a choice. Um, if you're already running MySQL, yes, it's also cool to put everything in MySQL. But not everybody may want to run MySQL. Plus, I didn't go into a lot of features um, about MongoDB because there isn't the time. You could, for example, one of the new features that we have is client-side field-level encryption, where the data is only decrypted on your machine. And if you store your data in the cloud, the cloud provider is never going to have a clue what you put in there. They're not going to be able to decrypt it. It's not encryption at rest, where if you steal the disk, you're not going to be able to read it. But even if you were to walk up to the machine, log into the MongoDB daemon, and query the database right there, you're just going to see a hot garbled mess. And it's stuff like that that is actually quite cool in MongoDB, because it allows you to protect user data. Um, and make it more secure. You have a bunch of shops, especially when we think of healthcare and stuff, where you do not want certain data to go to a cloud provider. Um, so there may be restrictions that force users to, do, to use a different database. And last but not least, scaling MongoDB. Last I checked, um, scaling MySQL was a pain in the butt. Uh, 
it may have changed since then. Um, but I always said, you know, if I give my son the documentation and show him how to copy paste something, he's going to be able to set up a sharded cluster on MongoDB himself within five minutes. It's really easy to shard and replicate something in MongoDB as opposed to some other systems. So that's why we would want to do it. But without a clear use case and a clear customer, it's really not worth the effort, to be honest. Thank but you. Great question. Is there any other question that you would like to ask Andreas? The last person to ask a question gets this deck of cards. Is there anyone willing to win a deck of cards? No. <laughs> uh, oh, there is, uh, there, is. Uh, there is a will for a deck of cards. Why would you use MongoDB in, in, in such a context? From a business perspective, yes. what's the reasoning behind doing all this effort? Let's assume I'm, I'm a business owner and yes. I'm interested in doing that. Why, w what would we, how would this enhance my business from, from a business point perspective? Hmm. That's a good question. A good question that I can't answer because I'm an engineer being paid by MongoDB. So I would tell you because it's awesome because it's the best database there ever is, because the PHP team at MongoDB is just awesome. Um, but this is a question that I'd like to reverse. Now, let's assume everybody was using MongoDB and its features, and somebody came up and said, what's the advantage of switching to MySQL or PostgreSQL? Well, there isn't any, because you're using MySQL because, well, when you started in PHP, Raise your hand if your first database that you used was MySQL. Okay. Please raise your hand if you're still using MySQL because it was the first database that you used when you started doing PHP. Don't be shy. I won't judge you. Please raise your hand if you've switched to PostgreSQL or MariaDB. Hmm, pretty good. And that's the problem in the PHP ecosystem. It's really easy to get started. You install XAMPP on your computer and you use it. You're going to start out with MySQL. And even getting people to change to PostgreSQL, how much convincing did you have to do to your superiors, to your business people to support going to PostgreSQL? I mean, what's the advantage? It's the same database. It takes SQL. What's the big thing? Like I said, there's scalability in MongoDB. You can shard like crazy. If you use MongoDB Atlas, our hosted solution, you can create clusters that span multiple data centers that go to different regions. You can very easily shard by regions. So, you know, if you say, well, probably a bad example now since we don't want any Russian customers anymore, but if you have Russian customers, you have to store their customer data in Russia. It's actually quite easy to do because you can create sharding rules for that. So it's that. Um, like I said before, queryable encryption, si uh, client-side field-level encryption, where your data is never going to go into the cloud decrypted. And even your server admins can't read it because the keys are in Amazon K uh, KMS, and they don't have access to those keys. It's those things. It really depends on your use case. But if you're just running Cilius on MySQL because you've started using MySQL, honestly, it's best to keep running it that way. I hope that answers it. If not, next time I'm going to bring a business person to give you a better answer because I'm an engineer. I'm biased. Uh, we do not have anything more to bribe you. Uh, but no, the, no the, last person gets, okay. uh, the last person gets the deck, so if somebody else has a question, they can steal it from him. No? No? Going once? Going Three, twice? Two. Three. You. There you go. It's from Heroku, not from, my, uh, from MongoDB. We're not cool enough to have a deck of cards. Uh, Andreas, thank you very much for your speech.